back, everyone, for the second half of our session, which will focus in this side of the room on tips and techniques for hearing the most with the cochlear implant. Um, I'll be doing this session, and I'll be joined by Lindsay Zomback in just a minute, and she's going to lead off. Um, Lindsay Zomback is the lead clinical spe specialist in speech language pathology at University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. And she provides oral rehabilitation uh, for children and babies, uh, for adults, teens. She's across the whole age spectrum. Um, and she is active in her field, um, both in Ohio, where she serves on the Early Intervention uh, Committee, um, as well as nationally, where she is an Ohio State Champion for American Cochlear Implant Alliance. So we're delighted that she would join us here today for this event, because she is one of the country's real specialists in uh, providing therapy for uh, adults with hearing loss. So over to you, Lindsay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donna. That was such a lovely introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, as she said, I'm Lindsay Zombeck, and I'm really excited to spend the next bit of time with you all talking about some tips and techniques for hearing the most with a cochlear implant. So we're going to look at some of what the research says about oral rehabilitation and about things you can work on with a cochlear implant. Um, a lot of this will tie in um, for things that you can even start if you have hearing aids. So don't feel like like you can't use this if you don't have a cochlear implant yet. So the first thing I just want to talk about is we're going to probably be hearing this word oral rehabilitation a lot. So I want to just take a minute and talk about what we're talking about um, in this particular session and when we use that term. So the American Speech Language Hearing Association gave us this wonderful definition for oral rehabilitation. So when we start talking about adults, and this also applies to teens and older children as well, but when we talk about oral rehabilitation, we're talking about adjusting to your hearing loss, making the best use of your hearing aids or cochlear implants or whatever device you have for hearing, exploring the assistive listening devices that might help and other devices that might help in your life, managing conversations to improve communication between you and friends and loved ones, and taking charge of your communication. And I really like that last part because that, that's so important. Playing your active role to be able to take charge and make communication situations the best possible situations. So how important is oral rehabilitation? We see now that many cochlear implant centers are saying if you get a cochlear implant that you should get oral rehabilitation afterwards. Many centers are also starting to recommend that adults with hearing or with hearing aids also get oral rehabilitation. So this is a really important thing in the field. Um, we're, we're seeing it as being, as being recommended as part of gold standard care. So we know that people who use oral rehabilitation strategies end up having different outcomes and oftentimes have much better outcomes when they practice and learn how to use their new listening devices. So that's why this is so important. When we talk about oral rehabilitation, we're talking about the therapy that you use to help you to hear the best with your, with your hearing technology. So we're very used to this concept of if you get a hip replacement or a knee replacement, or if you're in some way injured, that you have a surgery, the surgeon fixes something, and then you do physical therapy, for example, afterwards to make it to make it better and to give yourself the best possible outcomes. So this is the physical therapy for your listening and for your hearing skills. So that's what we're talking about when we're gonna be talking about oral rehabilitation. Now there's many myths out there about oral rehabilitation. So I wanted to just take a minute to address some of these concerns. So, there's some concerns that adults already hear well, so they're not going to need assistance. They won't need oral rehabilitation. But when we look at something, hearing aids and especially cochlear implants, there's a learning curve 
that happens when we get these. Our brains have to learn how to listen to help us to hear as well as possible with them. So another issue becomes that a lot of times adults don't naturally know what to practice. They may say, ah, I need to do some work to hear better, but they don't necessarily know what to practice. So oral rehabilitation and working with a professional helps you with figuring out what to practice. There's also a myth that only advanced programming is needed. So what the audiologist does is the only step that's needed to have you hear the best with your hearing aids or cochlear implant. While appropriate programming is key and is so important, there are some skills that are brain-based and that you have to learn to have the best possible outcomes with hearing aids and cochlear implants. So it's it's a part what the audiologist does, but there's more to it than that. There's a myth that only struggling adults need oral rehabilitation, that you have to not be performing well in your own opinion in order to need oral rehabilitation. But what we find is that there's listening skills that we can improve and we see in the research that people can do better with if they work on it. And so those are the areas that we can target even if you're in theory, doing really well on the audiology measures with hearing aids or a cochlear implant. There is a perception sometimes that, well, maybe adults don't want oral rehabilitation. And uh, what I find is that when we talk about what oral rehabilitation really is and how it helps and what specific things we can work on, then a lot of times adults say, hey, you know what, this is worth it to me. This is worth my getting to the program or participating and, and all of that. The final myth I wanted to discuss was that insurance will not cover it. Um, I think this is a question that's definitely worth looking into with your local oral rehabilitation provider. Um, in many areas and with many insurances, it is covered. Um, it is a covered service. Um, there is some differences in the world depending on which type of service provider you visit. Um, audiologists can bill things differently than a speech language pathologist, for example, but working with your local provider to see if insurance will cover it. And um, I'm a speech language pathologist and I can tell you almost everybody in my uh, 17 years of practice has ultimately gotten coverage for it. So I wouldn't just say, eh, it's not going to be covered. It's worth looking into. So why does somebody who gets a cochlear implant need oral rehabilitation? We don't listen with our ears. That's something we're kind of taught incorrectly in school. Uh, you know, we're taught early on, we see with our eyes, we listen with our ears, but really that isn't the case. We truly listen with our brains. Our ears are the way of getting the information to our brain. So you can kind of think of the ears like a keyboard or a mouse for your computer. It helps input the information into the computer, your brain, but it's really the computer or your brain that's doing the processing. It's not what the keyboard is doing or the mouse is doing. It's what the internal processing of the computer is doing. And same with your listening. It goes in through your ears, but it's your brain that processes the information and makes sense out of those things that you heard through your ears. So cochlear implants operate very differently than a hearing aid. A hearing aid is going to be a microphone and a speaker system that carries the sound through your normal hearing pathway to your brain. It makes things louder, but as many people may be able to relate to, it doesn't always make things clearer. So the cochlear implant takes this in a new route and a new pathway in order to help bring sound to the brain. So the brain has to learn to adjust to this new sound and learn to listen to be able to fully understand this sound. And so that's where oral rehabilitation comes in. When we start talking about oral rehabilitation, it's a big topic. You could possibly work on auditory training, which is your listening skills and building up your listening skills. You might work on communication skills and ways to help um, improve communication between you and other people. You may also work on things like how to change the environment around you to create the best possible listening situation or work on what technology options do you have available to you? What can your hearing aid or cochlear implant do? And what types of accessories exist that might help you to hear better in specific situations? 
and the great thing about oral rehabilitation is that you can really work on so many other things as well. Anything that's troubling, we can look at finding a way to target. So since this isn't a uh, three-year course on oral rehabilitation and we're, we're short on time today, we're going to just look at a few topics. Um, so today we're going to cover how to help with communication in general, some general tips you can do, tips for listening in noisy places, tips for appreciating music, and then we're going to turn things over to the fabulous Donna Sorkin so we can talk about some tips for talking on the telephone. And I'm really excited for that part. So when we talk about tips for helping communication in general, there are some general tips like just making sure when you get a cochlear implant or when you have your new hearing aids that you wear these devices whenever you're awake. Having them on as much as possible throughout the day gives your brain the best chance and the most opportunity to listen to speech, to listen to other noise, and to make all these connections to understand everything that you're hearing. You want to spend time daily communicating with others. We're seeing in the research that the more time you spend talking with other people and listening to speech tends to be related to better outcomes with your cochlear implant. So it's important to find time daily to communicate with other people. If you get a cochlear implant, for example, and it's brand new, then you want to spend some time listening with just your cochlear implant. Your brain is already a pro with your hearing aid. It already hears as well as it's going to hear. So you want to try with the cochlear implant so you can learn how to rely on that cochlear implant and, um, and how to build your, your skills with the cochlear implant. You want to set up the best possible environment for communication, so you want to reduce the noise. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, so I'm not going to spend much time at this moment talking about it, but you want to figure out how to make it not so noisy so that you can hear as well as possible. You also want to look at things like assistive listening devices. Are there um, opportunities through your programming that you can use for hearing better? Um, did your cochlear implant or hearing aid come with a microphone that you can use to, to hear? Those are generally sent and given to people because they work. They really help to increase your ability to understand. So it's a great idea to see what you have available to you and learn how to use those things if you don't already know how to use them. The final advice is to practice, practice, practice. Now, what do I mean when I say practice, practice, practice? So in the situation where you have a cochlear implant, you want to use your cochlear implant only, and you want to practice these skills to build up your listening skills. So when you're practicing, you don't necessarily always want to include a visual cue. So no lip reading as much as possible, unless you need it for understanding. So try to do it without lip reading, because we're really trying to build your listening skill in this situation. One thing you can practice is listening for words that are long or short and try to repeat back the words you hear. When I talk about long or short, what I'm talking about is words maybe that have different numbers of syllables. So pick a category, for example, fruits, and try listening to a short word like pear, which is only one syllable, versus a longer word like banana, and trying to see which word you hear. So that's something that you can do to kind of start listening if speech isn't clear at first. When that is getting pretty easy for you, you can do, try listening for words in a known category. So have your a listening partner tell you a category. For example, pizza toppings. And then they'll say a word and you're going to repeat back the word you hear. And maybe you'll start with some toppings that are a little bit easier, like pepperoni or cheese. But then your listening partner, as you get better, can be can get a little more creative and come up with you know some of those more controversial pizza toppings like pineapple. You can practice common sentences and repeating a sentence that your listening partner has said. For example, think about all the things that happen when you go to see a doctor. Write down the sentences of what you're likely to hear. So when you go to the front desk, these days people are going to ask you the COVID questions. If you've had any exposure to COVID, they're going to ask you maybe for your um, insurance card and your identification. 
Think about the questions that they likely are going to ask so you can practice listening to those in advance. The nurses that greet you are going to ask a whole new set of questions, maybe about your medications or about your past medical history, and the doctor is going to ask other questions too. So thinking about those things ahead of time, and you can do this for all the different situations that you're going to be going into. For example, offices, stores, restaurants. Think about what kind of questions you potentially are going to get, and you can practice listening to those in advance. Now, if you don't have a listening partner at home, because a lot of people don't have someone that they can practice with on a regular basis, or if you're to the point where you're really just trying to listen to a lot of conversation and listen to a lot of different types of voices, men, women, people who have accents, a great opportunity is to use um, YouTube videos or turn on your TV. And in both situations, turning on closed captioning or initially to read along as you're listening. So some of my favorites are TED Talks, um, the program Listen and Read Along on YouTube. And then there is a computer program called Randall's ESL Lab, which has some excellent opportunities for listening and reading along. Um, if you are more comfortable using your television, you can watch your television with closed captions on, take off your other hearing aid and work on listening with just your cochlear implant. Your listening partner, also if you're working at this level of conversation, can work on reading a sentence from a book and having you repeat the sentence back. What Once you've really mastered doing the sentences, you can have people repeat back uh, two sentences or even have them read you a paragraph and repeat well, you might not be able to repeat back the paragraph. I certainly wouldn't be able to get all those sentences correctly, but you can summarize what you heard or answer questions about it. So in terms of some free programs that exist, um, the cochlear implant companies have some great resources for practicing with um, cochlear implants. And this would apply if you have hearing aids as well. So um, the nice thing about these programs is you don't have to have that company's cochlear implant device in order to register and use their rehabilitation software. So if you, for example, have advanced bionics, you are welcome to go to Cochlear's website or MedL's website to get more information. So these are some free rehabilitation programs. Um, advanced bionics has sound success. Um, you create an account and they have a lot of different types of activities. Cochlear Corporation has Communication Corner, where again, you go to their site, you create an account, and there's a lot of activities available for you. And then MedL has oral rehabilitation kits that you can download that give you wonderful activities that you can try. Um, and then this site's a little different in that you can go and download anything they already have, or, and additionally, you can sign up, and then any new ones that come out will be emailed to you. So it's a great, great free resource. Um, if you're looking for a program, a lot of centers are recommending the Angel Sound um, on the computer. You can go to Angel Sound. Um, there is an iPad um, and tablet version that's called iAngel Sound. It has free exercises. The computer version has a lot um, more variety in what you can practice. Um, it also has some music training. It has more conversational level training where um, iAngel Sound works more on certain speech sounds and word level practicing. But both programs let you practice in quiet and in noise. And, are free. So they're, they're, they end up being really nice programs. When we start talking about listening and noise, um, in general, when I meet with adults who have hearing loss, whether they're using hearing aids, cochlear implants, whatever type of device they're using, listening and noise may be the most frequently reported challenge that people have. It's hard to listen and noise. It does seem to get better. And many people who get a cochlear implant report and are shown in research to do better with their cochlear implant than what they did with hearing aids and noise. But we know it's something that's challenging. And the great thing is, is that the research shows us it's that it's something you can practice and build up your listening skills in. So you can get better at listening and noise. It may not be perfect, but you can get better at listening and noise. So one area with listening and noise that we talk about in oral rehabilitation is environmental modifications. So how can you get the closest to the person that you want to hear? 
Is it a positioning thing? Is there a way to sit closer? Um, if you're going to a family dinner, is there a side of the table where you can sit next to the people you really want to speak with? Or if they're far away and you want to hear everybody, can you use some kind of FM or DM technology, um, some kind of streaming technology to your cochlear implant or hearing aids with a microphone um, so that you can be able to hear the people you want to hear a lot better. Um, this also is helpful for things like the car because you can hear people sitting next to you or in the back of the car. Um, think about in your environment, what sounds can be turned off. It's really hard to listen with a lot of the dishwashers that go on today or when the washing machine is going. So try not to have conversations in those areas. Um, if somebody's talking to you and the television is on, push mute. And um, so we're, we're good with that. So turn, turn off the TV, turn off the radio, try to make it as quiet as possible so you can have your full concentration on that conversation and it won't be as hard to hear. Also think about what settings exist on your hearing aid or cochlear implant to help in noise. So um, the audiologist can work with you to try to figure out how to listen in these noisy conversations. What I do too is we talk about strategies. So for example, if you go into a restaurant and you're going, try making a reservation ahead of time. You want a table that's away from the kitchen. You want a table that's in the corner and you get to be the corner person. That way you're not hearing sounds behind you and you're only getting those sounds that are right in front of you. You don't wanna be around the wait staff service stations where they're gonna be picking up loud silverware all night. You don't wanna be by speakers or bands and consider times when the restaurant's gonna be less busy so that it's as quiet as possible. You can think about each of these situations in advance and give yourself the quiet that you need. So when you're trying to improve your listening and noise skills, you want to repeat those communication exercises we talked about a couple of slides ago, a couple minutes ago, and do them again, but do them this time with noise added. So have your partner read a sentence from a book that you're going to repeat with background noise, you know, put the music on, put the TV on, turn on the dishwasher, make some additional noise so that you can repeat that sentence. You want to start with really soft noise because a little bit of noise makes a huge impact. So start with soft noise and then increase the volume of that noise and keep focusing on the person that you want to hear. Have your partner read the entire paragraph or page, summarize what you heard, but again, have that noise on. So you can do these exercises again, but make it noisy. For music appreciation, there's many aspects of music that we know can be improved. So there's some melody recognition, uh, timbre, which is the voice of the instrument. It's how the same song can play and you know that, uh, that a piano is playing it and a guitar is playing it. It's the it's that voice. Um, so you can get better at picking that up through a cochlear implant. You can get better with pitch recognition and knowing high pitch and low pitches. Um, lyric comprehension, so understanding the words, and then overall just by practicing you can start understanding and like music better, it may sound better. So some tips in general would be to try music streaming through the microphones of um, your cochlear implant. Some people might want to actually stream it directly, some people might not like the streaming sound as much and might want it to be just through the regular microphone system. Try multiple types of music. Some music is more complex than others other types of music or may have more instruments and it might sound better or worse through a cochlear implant. Thinking about things like rhythm, pitch, lyrics, what's hard, target that area. If it's rhythm, you can focus on tapping out a rhythm. If it's pitch, you can work on listening to slight pitch differences using a keyboard. Um, and with lyrics, lyrics are all over the internet these days. You can find the lyrics to any song you want. Lyrics is really listening and noise. So reading your sentence and listening to the music that, uh, listening to it in music. So it's kind of like listening in noise. So by building up your listening and noise skills, you can actually build up your lyric skills as well. Try individual instruments first, focusing on those that are found in the music. So search on YouTube. If you like rock music, look for a couple guitar solos. You're gonna find millions of guitar solos that people have loaded that you can listen to. Then try the drums, then try the bass. 
when you can understand each of those instruments, start looking for some duets of guitar and drums or guitar and keyboard, trying to find things to make those instruments jump out. So there's a lot of things you can do to understand music better. What I want to do at this point is transition over into some telephone use conversation. So we're going to transition over to Donna. Um, I believe you all have had the opportunity already to meet Donna, but uh, Donna Sorkin is the um, executive for the Cochlear Im American Cochlear Implant Alliance. Um, she's played such a huge part for this whole conference and is phenomenal. And I, I think you're going to be able to learn a lot from Donna and I'm very excited, so I'm going to be quiet so she can take over. Thank you. I'm so sorry I was muted. <laughs> um, what I what I said before I unmuted myself um, was that I really identified with a lot of what Lindsay was recommending in terms of her uh, suggestions to you for using oral rehabilitation tips and. Um, I received my cochlear implant um, almost 30 years ago. And at that time, there was so little advice that we provided to people. So um, I wish Lindsay had been around for me uh, at that time. I'm going to focus entirely um, on the issue of telephones and really taking charge of the phone and helping you if you're an adult or um a parent of a teen, if you're in here, um, about getting the phone back. And what I find very often is um, many adults who have received a cochlear implant have not used a telephone to actually talk on um, in many years. And teens, um, let's face it, they don't talk on the phone very much. They use the phone for everything but talking. Um, and so people have become accustomed to texting and and using other visual uses and um, often have just let the phone sit by the wayside and don't use the phone very much at all. And um, they're very often fearful about getting back to the phone again. And many recipients um, have never used Bluetooth um, or other ways to gain a high quality direct connect signal. And we're going to talk about connectivity. Um, and even telecoils, which have been around since 1946, are too often not a feature that people used on their hearing aids. Um, unfortunately, not all audiologists just emphasize the use of the telecoil. Um, and lastly, let's face it, um, the internet and use of email and texting has really replaced um, the use of the phone. And so we're really talking about getting that back again. Um, millennials don't use telephones very often to talk. This is um, a really typical picture. Um, my son, um, who's uh, in his 30s, um, if I want to talk to him and I call him on the phone, I'll get a text back that says, hi, what do you want? <laughs> I have to make an appointment to talk to my son on the phone. Um, so that's kind of where we are as a society. But um, I personally think it's, it's, it's really important to be able to learn to use the phone. And a lot of this just has to do with gaining the confidence to do that. Um, many adult recipients are uneasy about using the phone um, and they wonder about um, whether they'll be able to understand the person on the other end and if they're gonna make a mistake and respond correctly. Um, and the other issue is which is the best phone to talk on, you know, and so that's one of the other issues that we have is really figuring out the phone side of it. Um, it's also important to practice. And Lindsay talked about practice a lot, but I really feel with use of the phone, you have to gain confidence. And the only way you're going to get that is to practice. And um, that also will help you determine which telephones and which settings on the telephones are best for you. Um, and it will also help you to practice with the whole connectivity side of things, the options that can really help you to improve your performance. And I'm going to talk about connectivity as well. 
So some overall strategies for using telephones um, are to uh, assess the various components that can help someone make a phone call with renewed hearing via a cochlear implant because you haven't been using the phone because you didn't get enough information from hearing aids. So this is really um, sometimes an, a, something people haven't done for eight or 10 years. In my case, I hadn't used a phone for five years. And so it was really a matter of, of trying and gaining that confidence. Um, I'm gonna tell you the, a story later about who it was that helped me gain that confidence. Um, and you have to also know how to manipulate the key variables. Um, and this is often very individualized and personalized. So what's good for, for a friend of yours that has a CI may or may not be what you need. So you have to really try these things out um, and practice um, in a safe context um, initially with someone um, who you trust that you're not going to be embarrassed in front of, um, or you can also use some of the tools that are available. And I'm going to recommend some ones to look at. Um, and all of the lessons I'm going to share with you apply regardless of which cochlear implant device you have. I'm not going to talk about specific devices today. So let's begin with talking just a little bit about the telecoil. Um, and that little visual at the top there is um, what a telecoil looks like. It's really just a special circuit uh, inside the audio processor, and it's designed to pick up electromagnetic signals from the phone. Um, a telecoil can be in a cochlear implant processor or in a hearing aid. Um, and then what happens is the magnetic signals or induction signals uh, in the phone are then wirelessly transmitted to the audio processor by using the, an assistive listening device such as the neck loop, which looks like this. You would put this around your neck and plug it in like that, or by using the telecoil um, in your hearing aid or some other device. And telecoils I find are very underappreciated and often underutilized. And they are included as um, Meg mentioned earlier today in most current CI processors that may not be in all of the off-ear devices going forward. Um, but honestly, T-coils are so common in public theaters, et cetera, in Europe, they're not gonna go away. I really feel like this isn't something we um, will be uh, not seeing in the future. And of course, they're also helpful to access assistive listening devices. Um, so what's Bluetooth and why should we be concerned um, about uh, Bluetooth if we're a, a CI user? Um, and essentially, it's those earbuds that you see people using all the time. Those are um, a connection for Bluetooth and they provide short range um, wireless connectivity um, to exchange information between a fixed and a mobile device. So um, for those of us who have cochlear implants, we use them for mobile phones um, and to other devices like the TV, um, computers, other people people, music, um, all of the CI companies have built in or external devices that support Bluetooth. Um, some of them are built in and some of them are uh, external devices. Some cell phones have direct connect to CI processors. So this is kind of a new thing that's happened in the last two years or so. Um, and I have to say, honestly, for me, the best and most reliable access to sound is with Bluetooth um, and for with the telephone. And, and that's just the case. It may be different for others who prefer telecoil. Um, and you really have to try to see. There are some negatives associated with them. They uh, drain the battery life of, of your processor. Um, if you're using an external, you need to charge it. And they may be an extra expands depending upon um, which company you have. 
Now, let me get to the meat of this discussion, all of the different variables. And these are the things that may, may get challenging for us um, if we're trying to use the phone. Um, the first thing is the type of phone. And there's lots of variability in those phones. Um, we talk about wireline phones, and that's the you know old fashioned phones that we all have in our house or have in the office. Um, cordless wireline phones, and that's the little picture that you see there, the top right, um, and mobile phones. Um, and so these all have different characteristics. Um, cordless phones are notorious for causing interference with hearing technology. And so you want to stay away from those. Um, and you want, to, you want to stick with wireline or mobile and you want to try those out. Um, then there's the issue of connectivity between the phone and your processor. So that's an, another variable. Um, there's the sound processor setting and whether you wanna use your phone with what's called acoustic coupling. That means, are you just gonna hold the phone up to your, to your processor like that? Or are you gonna use Bluetooth or telecoil um, to connect? Um, and so if you're using telecoil, how much mixing do you want to have? And what that means is, do you want the whole signal to come in via telecoil or do you want it to be 50-50 so that you're getting some environmental sound and some the rest of the sound coming in via the phone? And these are things you have to think about and talk to your audiologist about. Um, there's the phone placement in relation to your, to your ear. And of course, your ear being your sound processor. Um, once when I was in a phone store trying um, out phones, I put the, the phone near my processor, of course, um, rather than right next to my ear. And the salesman thought I was crazy. And I explained to him that's where my ear was. He, I don't think he ever got it at all. Um, but there's also the issue of finding the sweet spot if you have, um, if you're using um, particularly a T-coil. So that's a, another issue you have to think about. And there's volume. And I typically use um, the volume on my sound processor up a little bit when I'm on the phone. And there's also the volume on the telephone. And if you want that to be up a little bit from what other people in your family use. Um, so those are things you need to think about. Um, and then when you look at the phones, how does it sound to you? What's the clarity of the phone for you? It doesn't matter what it sounds like to your spouse or to your child. What does it sound like to you? What's the quality of the signal coming into you? And what's the clarity of the speaker coming into you? And what's the environmental noise? So all of those kinds of things come into play when you're evaluating the telephone and evaluating specific times when you're using the phone because it also can vary if you're in a noisy place and you're trying to use the phone. So I talked uh, initially in the last slide about the types of phones and of course landline phone use is declining everywhere but you may still have one in your house or office. Um, I always found that at the workplace the landline phones that were part of a system often had poor sound quality um, and were more challenging for me. Um, and then I mentioned before the cordless phones having um, uh, interference issues with hearing devices and being something that you should stay away from. Um, cell phones, of course, are the way of the future and people are gonna be using those um, with or without these connectivity options. And they may be your best bet if you could find a cell phone that works really well for you. Um, and it is important to try out um, those cell phones so you know which one works well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later because um, there are some things to watch out for with cell phones. Um, all of the CI companies have options for using mobile phones, um, and there are certainly differences in 
in how they work with different telephones. So again, you try things out so you know what's going to work well for you. Um, and then some processors do allow you to stream directly uh, into the cell phone. Okay, so mobile phones actually have accessibility ratings that are required by the FCC. Um, and that happened because when we transitioned in this world uh, from analog mobile phones to digital wireless phones, um, we realized those of us that were working in consumer organizations, as I was at the time, um, that um, there was actually interference between those phones and hearing devices, both hearing aids and cochlear implants. Um, I was in Europe when the mobile phones, the new type of mobile phones were first um, rolled out and uh, they weren't in the US yet. And I still remember standing next to someone who was using one of these new phones and getting a big buzz into my cochlear implant. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, so, when that happened, the consumer organizations and professional organizations worked together with the FCC um, to implement some changes. And you know, I'm sure you can read about that if you want to hear more about it. But the key takeaway is that those phones are supposed to be rated now. And there's a rating that's called an M rating for the microphone setting and a T rating, which refers to the telecoil setting. Higher numbers always indicate better compatibility. So the phone that I am currently using has a rating of M3T4, which means that I theoretically should be able to use the T-coil with it, but I can't. Um, and no one can explain to me why that is. Um, so you really need to try these things out for yourself so you know what's going on. So my keys to success. Um, I carefully select my phone instrument each time I upgrade. And my favorite phone is an old fashioned clunker that I'm gonna show you a picture of. Um, and I like it with telecoil, unlike my cell phone. Um, I can use my mobile acoustically, meaning just holding it up to my ear or with Bluetooth. And I love Bluetooth and that's really my favorite option. Um, I often use the phone volume full up, and I also select a phone that is loud. And that's what works for me, but that's what I do. Um, typically, I try three different mobile phones each time I upgrade because there are differences in clarity for me. And so I find the one that works the best for me. Um, when I go into a phone store, I insist that they activate, activate the phone for me to try out. And that's what you should do. They may act like they don't do that because um, many phone stores don't do it. But the FCC rules say that they are required to provide activated phones for people with hearing loss. So just be persistent about it and ask to talk to the manager. That's my 30-year-old favorite landline phone that I still use on my desk. It's followed me everywhere I went, including when I worked in different offices. So here's some more phone tips. Um, practice with a listening partner you feel comfortable with. And my personal favorite listening partner when I was initially learning to use the phone again was my mom. She was so anxious for me to be able to talk to her on the phone. So anytime I wanted to practice with her, I would call her. And she was very reassuring, even though I would get two words or three words on the conversation. She would say, oh, you're doing so much better than you were last week. Oh, you're really improving. And that was really important part of the process for me because you do need that practice and you do need assurance from someone and also someone that isn't gonna judge how you're doing. Um, remember, there's a lot of variables. I went through those, you have to try all of them out and get a solution that works for you. You may be able to stream sound into both ears using two CIs or a CI and a hearing aid. And you can do that using Bluetooth or telecoil neck loop. Um, consider increasing the volume on your sound processor when you talk on the phone. Try out, see what works for you. 
um, ask your cochlear implant manufacturer for guidance. They all have really great people to help with that. Um, recorded messages, those annoying messages that come in on your phone, look at those as a practice opportunity and use them. And also just recognize that certain speakers are going to be more difficult um, or maybe even impossible. You know, if someone has a very thick accent, it's, it may be not possible for you to understand them on the phone and don't get frustrated by it. Just recognize that some people are gonna be hard or impossible. Um, when I find that happens to me and it still happens, I ask my husband to come in and help me finish the call. Um, and I, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. And just practice and keep trying. Okay, so here's my last slide, which are some tools and tips. Lindsay gave you some for oral rehabilitation, and here's some that I think are really helpful um, on a phone. Um, that one of, one of the really nice ones um, uh, is actually um, uh, from Cochlear, um, and it's the telephone with confidence tip. And then there are some great tips from Medel for cochlear implant recipients. And I've given you the link there. Um, and then I, I don't want to close without mentioning the fact that we have um, an adult rehabilitation blog. It's free. Um, and all of you that are here on um, tonight, today, will be getting um, prompts from us when we put something new on the blog, but you can just go on anytime. It's open to the world um, and look at those uh, blog tips that we have. And there's a really nice one that's on the telephone. Um, so I recommend that you look at that for more information on the phone. So that's my last slide. And Mary, I think we have a, some nice questions that have come in. And so um, Lindsay and I are really happy to take those right now. And you can type more in if you wish. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you, Donna. That was really fabulous. So those are some excellent tips. And I think now we're going to open up for questions. So if you have questions, please submit them and we'll see what we can what we can get to and hopefully we can get to all of them. We tried to save a lot of time for your questions today. Um, it looks like some of the first questions that came in um, were things that I think I can go ahead and take, Donna, if that's okay with you. Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I think one of the first questions that came in was regarding speech language pathologists. Um, and providing services for um, oral rehabilitation. And so speech language pathologists are usually considered under a list of providers for various insurance companies, whether that's private or for, um, for Medicare. Sometimes, especially if you're working with a speech language pathologist who's with a center instead of a private speech language pathologist, it might just be under some of the hospital services and um, general kind of hospital provider. Um, but uh, the, the person who posed the question was asking about um, the procedure codes that are used for oral rehabilitation. For a speech language pathologist, um, I generally use the, uh, the general um, speech sound production and language evaluation code, which is 92523. And um, then Medicare has speech language pathologists bill for any form of auditory training and oral rehabilitation under the, ge the general um, speech and language code, the 92507 for some private payers. And then also um, if there are audiologists who are billing for services, um, there's additional codes. Um, so audiologists and also speech language pathologists can bill for an evaluation of auditory rehabilitation, which is code 92626. And then for the therapy side of things, um, there are two auditory rehabilitation codes for therapy, um, and they are broken up depending on whether somebody has a uh, prelingual hearing loss, which is 92630. And um, whether somebody then has a postlingual hearing loss, which uh, the code is 92633. 
So there's a little bit of variation there. So depending on who the service provider is, you can build different things. Um, the speech language pathologist can build the same codes that the audiologists build, but the audiologists cannot build the, the speech codes that I mentioned. So um, Let's I see, believe- There's another one here for you. Um, what are the best online exercises or programs for improving hearing in noisy environments? Yes. So um, what I find is that a lot of the programs that exist are designed more for listening and quiet. And so a lot of times I take the existing programs and then add my own noise to them. So I think um, like Advanced Bionic Sound Success does have the ability to do some practicing in noise formally. But a lot of times what I recommend for people to kind of get the most uh, bang for their buck, so to speak, is doing uh, TED Talks. Um, so there are technology and education talks that are available for free. You can get them through YouTube, um, anywhere on the internet. There's thousands of talks that are pre-recorded, um, and you have the ability to turn on captioning for those, and you can read along with the captions, or you can just listen. I like those because you get to practice conversational skills first um, in a in a artsy, not so good visually listening type condition. Um, they do a lot of the side view and a lot of the panning out. So you don't get a great visual cue, um, but it allows you to listen to women's voices, men's voices, and people who have accents that are different from your own. Um, and you get to listen to that through a speaker system, which is going to be similar to what you're hearing on the telephone, for example, or similar to what you're going to be hearing in a noisy situation, once people are better at following that whole conversation, then what I tell them to do is turn on the television while they're trying to do that or turn on a radio, add some form of noise source so that you can practice that skill again in noise. You can control the volume and make it quieter if you need a little bit easier, or you can turn up the volume to hear it a little bit more. But I find that when people can do that skill really well, it does transfer nicely and they're able to um, understand and pay attention to the voice they want in noise better. So here's a question. Um, someone's asking in the last talk, um, that was when Megan was talking, she said um, that some of the newer off the ear processors, the Canso, will not be able to connect with a T coil. And that's true, I think, of um, other off the ear devices as well. Will folks with the Canso be able to access uh, telecoils? Um, as I understand it, there will be um, a, a fix for that. You'll have to use some uh, other um, device that uh, Cochlear has that will allow you to uh, access T coil with the Canso. Um, I I am uh, not an audiologist for cochlear nor with anyone, so I, I I can't tell you exactly what that is. But I have heard audiologists say that that is the case. That there will be um, a device that will allow you to do that. Lindsay, can you? Is it? Does that uh, consistent with what you know as well? Yes, my understanding is that with the Canzo 2 specifically, since it does not have its own telecoil feature, um, it does have um, the mini mic 2 plus that comes as an option with the cochlear implant. Um, and the mini mic 2 plus has telecoil functionality. And so my understanding is if you have the Canzo 2 and you connect through your mini mic 2, to your um, assistive listening devices, that that would allow you to kind of patch into being able to use telecoil functionality. Also, not an audiologist, so <laughs> we'll definitely want to confirm that with an uh, with an audiologist or with a representative from Cochlear, or if you're talking about um, some of the other companies that have off the ear features. But that that's my understanding of how how that is still possible. Yeah. I, I think that's consistent with what I uh, remember hearing. Here's, here's another question that you may know better than me. I'm going to be guessing at it if I answer it. The question is, is it possible 
that a cochlear implant when connected to accessory devices could pick up someone else's frequency technology. I was recently on an airplane and had my mini mic hardwire connected to the audio jack, which is a great thing to do. I've done the same thing, um, hoping to watch a movie, but it picked up someone else's music. I have no idea where the set sound was coming from. And after several attempts at turning off and back on my device and unplugging the cord, I finally could hear the movie sound. Very strange. I'm gonna guess at this, you may know the answer. So do you wanna take a, a, a crack at it or? Oh, it's going to be me taking a crack at it. Um, I have not experienced somebody reporting this situation before, but clearly it seemed to have happened. I mean, it seems like there's so many other devices that can accidentally be on a different wavelength that you accidentally connect to. And even things, I feel like if you take your key fob for your car to like another state, you can accidentally open other people's cars sometimes. So I would imagine there is there is a way that you might accidentally stumble, especially in a traveling situation on somebody's own kind of personal streaming device. I think they have their own I'm, I'm not going to have the te technological words, but their own bandwidths or their own frequency ranges, I guess, that are set for cochlear implants to be able to stream. So it the, the goal is to not have that happen very often, and it should be very rare. But clearly, if it happened to you, it sounds like it can happen. So I, I would talk with your um, representative from your cochlear implant company and see if there's anything they can do, especially if it happens more than once. And hopefully that was just a, a freak thing that happened at one time. Very strange indeed. It is strange. We have two more questions, one of which I think I can answer pretty fast. Um, it's a great question. She says, Donna, any tips for starting liking to talk on the phone? I can understand what I hear, but I hate talking on the phone. I think it's too invasive. I, I am, I have to say, not thrilled to talk on the phone like some people are. My husband could talk on the phone all day long. Um, if it's someone I really miss and want to chat with, um, like my son um, or my sister, I will talk on the phone. So it may be that you never love the phone. I still think it's important for you to know how to use the phone because you may need to make a call in an emergency. I mean, you may, you may need to be able to talk to your doctor on the phone. I, I had terrible um, effects after my second um, COVID shot and my internist wanted to talk to me on the phone. Um, so it was really important that I'd be able to do that. So um, keep doing it. Um, nobody's, no, there's nothing to say you have to talk on the phone, but I think what my point was, it's, a, it's good for you to know uh, how to do it, even if you don't enjoy chatting with people on the phone. So that was really my point. Um, this last one's for you, Lindsay. How can an old CI user, eight years of use with great outcomes, improve even more with his performance? So um, I think if you've had a cochlear implant for a long amount of time, I would think of a couple of different ways to think about um, where you might be struggling. So there's a couple of things that we know make listening harder. We know the enemies of good listening are distance. We know it's noise. We know it's situations where you have to kind of multitask, where you have to think about one thing while doing another thing and trying to listen at the same time. So those are all things that are very, very challenging. So what you can do is you can practice some of these higher level listening activities and think about how to add in those things that that lead to harder listening situations. So if you're doing really well in quiet, then you can think about maybe I can practice listening to conversation when it's noisy. If you're doing well with noise, then maybe can you have that same conversation and understand just as well when you're more distant from the speaker? Then can you do it when you're far away from the speaker and it's noisy? Because that's a really hard task. 
I've had some people practice with multitasking. Um, I knew somebody who uh, worked in a, a factory setting and had to unload boxes constantly and he couldn't keep unloading the boxes in a noisy place while his boss was at giving him new directions so we worked on trying to do another activity and still understand a conversation so try to fill in a crossword puzzle or do some math problems while a listening partner is talking to you and repeat back what they say and add noise. I mean, there's ways that you can try to um, expand what you're doing. The other thing that I would encourage everyone with hearing loss to really consider is the impact of auditory fatigue and how exhausting it is to listen all day. Um, for those of you who have been on kind of all day with us, or even those of you who have been here all afternoon, you're probably starting to get tired from listening this whole time. So think about what you can do to add breaks in your day, to try to, um, to increase your ability to pay attention and to take in novel information. And if you're going to do something like this, after this is over, don't go out to somewhere noisy. Try giving yourself a little bit of a break first and where you're not responsible for information and you can just have some peace and quiet before trying to move on. So that might be another way to get some better outcomes is think about how taxing your listening requirements are for that day and looking for times in your day when you can add in periods of quiet and that kind of rejuvenates you to allow you to hear everything you need to hear through the course of the day. That was great. Um, there, there are two more questions that I'm going to just combine. And someone's asked about hearing on conference calls and hearing on Zoom calls. And I'm going to combine that as one question. Um, so a conference, why is anybody talking on conference calls anymore? Everybody's gone to virtual. So it's so much easier to follow when you're on a virtual call because you can see people and get that visual aspect of it. And of course, Zoom now has captioning um, as do uh, some of the other um, virtual conferencing systems. So um, that's the first advice that I have is don't do conference calls, switch over to virtual. Um, and then somebody asked about um, being able to hear um, it, from your computer during um, a Zoom call. And there is, there is technology that, that you can use. It's gonna vary by device. Um, where you can plug in to your computer. It's usually with infrared um, and get a, a really clean signal um, into your computer. So that's one of those cases where you, you should play with it um, before you need to do it and practice. Um, and I think sometimes you can get a really clean signal that way. Um, we had some training that we did recently um, for our advocacy network, See I Can. And I think um, the person that told me about how she was listening is actually on with us today. I won't reveal her name. She knows who she is. And she was using um, an assistive device to plug into the computer and hear um, simultaneously from her CI on one side and her hearing aid on the other. Um, we were concerned about the way the captioning was working and she said it was okay. Um, I could hear everything. So um, it is possible to do this. Uh, I don't think I have time today to go through all the, the details of doing it, but but um, you can email me or you can, you can certainly um, check with your audiologist or with your CI company about um, what connectivity you need to use to be uh, able to do that. We don't want to keep you past the uh, time that we said we were going to end. And we did want to give you a chance to go back to the exhibits, which are still open for you. And uh, Lindsay and I want to thank you for being with us um, for this session. And I want to encourage you to get involved uh, in the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. We really want to uh, have um, more involvement by um, adults and by parents in the organization, particularly at some of our advocacy activities. Um, so, so be in touch and join CI Can, our new advocacy network. Um, and we'll. We'll see you around soon. Thank you so much for being part of the event today. Thank you, everybody.